Meatloaf, humongous rock star of the universe, in Heroes Helping Heroes. Special Olympians are the real heroes. I'm gonna give them everything I've got. But who's gonna help me? We'll help you, Meatloaf. But how? But how? By returning this coupon today. The superheroes need 250,000 of their friends to help the 1987 International Summer Special Olympics Games. Please, help if you can. Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast, Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of the most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. You expect me to random panta? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die! (laughs) (laughs) Pop quiz, corpse on the ground. (laughs) It's random banter time, buddy! <laughs> How you doing, Rusty Agent? <laughs> I am the rustiest of agents. And for all of our fans who don't listen to Honor Majesty's Secret Podcast, that cold open and our response to it may have confused you. <laughs> but if you check out the MI6 Rookie Agents uh, section of that podcast, you can hear uh, Jeff and I do uh, our own little submissions to their reports, starting after a view to a kill. So, just FYI, check those out. They're kind of fun. Rick randomly surprises me while we're doing a script and or doing a show, and then I get to answer a pop quiz on any number of random subjects of which I either know nothing about nor care anything about. It's it's kind of fun. A little from column A, yeah. a little from column B. <laughs> That's how we roll. So, um, random stuff for me. Uh, speaking of other podcasts, just last night, I had the opportunity to record another episode of Cheerscast. Hey, cool. With, with Ryan Daly, yeah. It was for Where There's a Will, There's a Way, which starred, oh, I'm going to totally blank on the actor's name, but he played Commandant Lassard from the Police Academy movies. He was a guest star on the episode. I can't help you. I have no I, clue I, right now. You can now. picture him, though. You can picture the guy, right? Older gentleman. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I had a really enjoyable time doing that. It was uh, pleasant. I I have fun being a guest on some of those shows, so it's kind of nice. Besides that, I, I know that we uh, this is going to come out way after Halloween. Where we're at right now, I just finished editing that. And for all of those that listened to that Halloween episode that we did with um, Sean from Secret Wars and Beyond, where we covered Sandman number 18, I just want to apologize for the... Very interesting recording session that we had. It was a comedy of errors of all different types of mechanical and equipment failures. And you got what you got. It was, that was what we got. It was, so, uh, it I blame Mephisto. Yeah, basically, it was technology problems on every side available. As near as I can tell, that was probably a month from when this, when you're listening to this one, because this is going to come out sometime around Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving to all of you and yours. Yeah. Enjoy food and the companionship of loved ones. Or, if not that, bring a co-host over to your house. Yeah, do that. Have a, get yourself a co-host. Invite them over. <laughs> they kind of they kind of have to, even if they don't want to, because otherwise, you know, it's going to be awkward when you see them that next Wednesday. Well, you know what? You are more than welcome to come over for our, to our house for Thanksgiving. Well, thank you very much. I have no idea what our plans are now, but I know that if we have that as an option. I'm not going to be there, but you're more than welcome to come over to our house. (laughs) It's the best time to invite people over. I'm not going to be there, but come on over. Uh, It'll be cold and dark, and you'll be alone. Happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) Better than the alternative. (laughs) Yeah, what, being warm and inside and comforted by my own own house? (laughs) Sounds right to me. (laughs) I I think uh, we're going to be over at my parents' house, and I think they have, uh, my family has nominated me once again to deep fry the... uh, turkey so. you do a good job of it i enjoy it we were just talking about that today at uh the class i was at and the, the teacher was like yeah my husband decided to deep fry a turkey one year and it just failed and i'm going it's not that hard <laughs> uh it, it is for some people uh i experienced it. i have a very limited palette of, exp- of uh knowledge mm-hmm. and uh it always amazes me when something that i'm like yeah that's really easy to do people just founder with it or fail with it abysmally right. and i'm like I don't know how to do anything in life. How could you not do that? A lot of patience, uh, follow instructions. All you need to do is go online and you know go to a reputable source, but follow the instructions online. 
that's about right. You have to have patience, make sure you've got a nice area, and if you have the opportunity, find somebody who has done it multiple times successfully and have them walk you through the steps. That helps as well. But uh, So a reputable source wouldn't be like splodeturkeybucket.com? That would be an extremely reputable source if that was your goal is to explode <laughs> a turkey. What about you? What is your random banter? Well, for funs and giggles, I apparently decided to get sick again because I only wanted about a half day of not being uh, not being ill. So, yay, that's fun. But uh, So that's minor because that's my uh, perpetual state of being. A uh, fun thing was about a week or so ago, my mom calls me and says, Hey, remember how I said my vision's a little blurry? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, I can barely see. Oh, well, that's cool. So we set up a, uh, you know, a eye exam appointment for her and, you know, Oh, okay, that's the next day. Cool. Okay, I'll, I'll come over and pick you up in the morning. Or, you know, when it's going to go on, we'll go over there and we'll deal with that. So I get over there and I'm like, oh, we got a little bit of time. Do you mind if I go, go grab a Coke? She has an old house, so the water heater is under the floor, you know, like on a dirt floor underneath the house uh, that you access through this closet where the Cokes are kept. And, I, and just out of habit, I just kind of stop and I listen and I go, you know, it's really kind of moist and muggy in this closet. And I'm hearing water run. So I'm thinking it's just going to be one of the braided uh, tubes, uh, you know, on the thing. Because, you know, sometimes they erode it. I'm just like, okay, I've dealt with that before. I can fix this. Not a problem. Go to the appointment. Go do the stuff. Come back. Huh. Well, shine a light in there and go, it's not spraying out of the tubes, but it sure is pouring out of the bottom. Let's find out what that could be. Hopefully it's not something super serious. Oh, maybe it's the, uh, the, the drain valve. Maybe that got loose. Okay. I'll tighten that up. No, that's not doing it. Okay. So that means it's an you know, internal tank and it happens, you know, uh, hot water heaters are supposed to last oh, about 12 years. This one's lasted like 27. <laughs> okay. So it was due. That's yeah. fine. Uh, so then I spent like, yeah, but it, I spent like six hours underneath the house in the yeah, you know, the end result was I, the problem was still there, but I lateralized it. <laughs> it's just in like a week of trying, you know, she had a, a person that she wanted to do it. And to, you know, I'm like, yeah. I could do this, but I can't I hired somebody, but trying to get their schedule and all that. And it's like, so that got wrapped up yesterday. So, Hey, cool. She's got hot water and water again. That's really awesome. And I took her to another eye exam because the eye doctor was like, well, you got some swelling and I think da da da. go see an ophthalmologist, go see. And it's kind of like, oh, you need cataract surgery. So, yay. <laughs> yay. So how does it feel just to have a life that's never ending? It just never ends. Yeah, never it's ends. just a chore-based life of it's being ill and not having the time to do anything about it. Because it's like, hey, I have to go and help a family member of you know, age two to two, two plus, basically. You know, beginning to ending. <laughs> I, I don't know what the problem is, Jeff, because... The way I see it, you've got plenty of time to do things. Yeah, I had enough time to finish working no, no, on the no, script no, today. No, no, no. Uh, you have plenty of time to finish things, such as giving us the two cents replay from last episode. Hey, that's two sentences. I might be able to finish that. <laughs> Power Pack has to wait an hour before they can go swimming after breakfast, so they decide to go and look at the crack house they destroyed the night before, where they stumble across trash, coming back from a drug delivery, and decide to track them back to their lair. Fortunately for them, Crazy Leg spots them and realizes that their boss back at base, the garbage man, could get rid of this drug-hating problem, which he does until Trash realizes that they need to team up with Power Pack to save their own lives from their abusive boss. Now that the Jim and Maggie spend their kid-free time in this issue wrestling off-panel, wink wink, two-sentence replay is over, why don't you give me a beer and tell us what our Power Pack pick is? My pleasure, my friend, and... I've got great news for you. Afterglow Ale? No. <laughs> I brought you a barley wine. Ooh, let's see what we think about this because I have we I know have I've had... never liked barley wine. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, because I don't have any recollection of ever ever having a barley wine that I've enjoyed. But But that's let's a show. try Gigantics Massive. Massive. That's a cool-looking piñata demon bull horse with bang teeth what the heck is that that is just crazy looking well can you guess why i chose this one uh massive is it because julie gets massive yep. in this one <laughs> yes and yeah that is not too dissimilar from the uh beast that they try to create out of uh the 
Oh, it's got two Austin. tongues, too. Wow, this is just crazy all over the place. It's got like a red skull mask on a pinata bullhead that's got fangs, and that is just crazy all over the place. And it looks like it's mounted on a wall. That's Yeah, that's a good-looking bottle. But yeah, yeah it's a bourbon barrel-aged massive 2008 barley wine. And this is a 14.3% ABV with a 65 IBU. That is a deep ruby. Now, I want to point out that according to this, it says that we um, the suggested glassware is a snifter, but we're just going to go with pint glasses yeah, or just whatever. I kind of here's my opinion on uh, appropriate glassware for beverages that hold the beverage. Yeah, you're pretty good. In making massive bourbon barrel aged, we used only British Golden Promise malt and boiled for eight hours, giving the beer a deep ruby color and rich malt flavor. We then aged massive in bourbon barrels for almost two years. Enjoy the richness and intensity now or after years and years and years more aging. Uh, well, I, I can go with the deep ruby. I mean, that's all, that's brown. That's dirt water. That is not ruby. That is not brown. That like dirt water. Oh, okay. I was like, and there's sediment in it. No, that's actually just some bubbles that are hanging out on the bottom. Yeah, there's no ruby to that. That is... Very, very opaque. And, you know, brown, you think of, like, opaque browns, and you're like, oh, like a stout or something. It's like, no, this is kind of like a sicklier-looking color. It's a muddy brown. Yeah, it is really muddy. And as far as the the smell, not bad. It smells okay. It's a little sweet. It's It's kind of that, uh, kind of a sweet kind of tart kind of thing. But you can definitely smell the barley wine of Uh it. Yep, it's a barley wine. (laughs) Sure taste that barley. Actually, I'm surely tasting that bourbon barrel. Yeah, it does have the bourbon barrel flavor. Um, right? It does definitely has a rich barley taste. Yeah. And bourbon barrel. Yeah, and it is. Barrel. it does really it, have that, that old bourbon barrel that's, flavor. That is the two prominent flavors. If yeah. you like barley, you're going to like this. I, it, it's not our first taste. I, I'm liking the second sip better on this one. I kind of like it a little same or less. I don't know. It's, it's not bad. It's actually got a smooth finish. Yeah, it... I don't know, it's kind of cloying onto my throat a little bit, or kind of seizing. I think we're a little bit different on this one. I think it's it's got a smoother finish for me, okay. um, but it definitely has a real strong taste up front. After yeah. I, after I you know, drink it down the throat, it's like, kind of goes away a little bit. I can taste the, uh, kind of the barley on the front of the tongue, and uh, the bourbon barrel on like the roof of the mouth, and mm-hmm. the back of the tongue. Mm-hmm. It is interesting. It's massive. It is massively in. Well, it's not that interesting. <laughs> I'm going to call it massive, though. It's okay. Well, it's it is. A massive it's massive taste. Yeah, it I, does I, have a massive taste. We'll uh, see in an hour what my views on it are. We'll see in an hour if I can drive home. <laughs> see in an hour if we, I let you stay here. And now the opening credits, if you please. Power Pack, issue number 33, November 1987. Special effects. Credits, writer, Louis Simonson. Pencils, John Bogdanov. Inks, Hilary Barta. Letterers, Joe Rosen. Colors, Peter Scotese. Editor, Carl Potts. Editor-in-Chief, Jim Shooter. And with a tip of the hat to R. Crumb. Turing Power Pack. Alex Power, a.k.a. Destroyer. He disintegrates matter and expels energy. Julie Power, a.k.a. Molecular Mistress of Density. Controls her molecular density. Jack Power, a.k.a. Counterweight. Increases or decreases the gravity of objects he touches. And Katie Power, a.k.a. Star Streak. She flies pretty darn fast, and she leaves a rainbow trail behind her. Franklin Richards, a.k.a. Tattletail, has prophetic dreams and can astral project his body while he sleeps. Guest starring the Power Parents, a fairly reasonable couple who are oblivious to their children having powers. And the New Mutants, Robert DaCosta, a.k.a. Sunspot, a mutant who can become incredibly strong. His body absorbs the sunlight and turns black when he uses his power. Warlock a robotic alien who can change his shape into anything he can think of. So we have two new characters that we just mentioned and a special recognition to R. Crumb. That would be Robert Crumb, a prolific artist who is known for his work in underground comics. His style was a satire on contemporary American culture. The tip of the hat refers to the way Warlock is walking in the first few scenes. He is in humanoid form, but is walking with an elongated step with his foot vertical to the ground. This is a style of walking Crumb is well known for. Well, Warlock might be walking with a happy gait, but his teammate Roberto is not. These two are fresh from a miniseries called Fallen Angels. During the events of that comic, Roberto and Warlock have teamed up with a group of teenage runaway mutants and had some pretty interesting adventures. 
and the reason why they were in the Fallen Angels was because Roberto had run away from his team of the New Mutants after losing his temper and injuring one of his teammates. Warlock followed the young man because, well, he's just the bestest alien friend you can possibly have. And now that they have had some adventures, Warlock is wondering why they are not returning to the New Mutants. And also... Larry, why so sad? Well, you see, Mr. DaCosta has an overactive sense of honor, and he still feels that he is not worthy to return to his team. He feels that he needs to really show the world that he is a hero. And, as if on cue, the Vulture, a C-level Spider-Man villain, steals some plot-convenient bags of money from a prominently positioned armored car and flies off. Perfect. This is what the young hero needs. Warlock quickly changes into a rocketing sky sled within... After him! A pair of mutants chase after the old buzzard. They chase the crook across the city, but quickly lose the bird-themed ne'er-do-well when he dives through a window of an old derelict building. Quitting the chase after failing to solve the puzzle of following an old man through a window, Sunspot uses his amazing mutant ability to give up and have a good wallow in a self-pity pool. Meanwhile, several miles away in a midtown Manhattan, home of the slumbering sleepyhead. Hey, it's the Fantastic Four skyscraper, the Baxter Building. And it's Franklin Richards sleeping with his arm around his teddy bear. And Franklin is having a special dream of a flying starship. What? Wait, that snark ship looks like... Oh, Warlock and Sunspot chasing the Vulture looks like the snark ship. Well, surely Franklin will realize this, right? Well, no. In fact, the little powered-up boy decides he needs to alert his friends immediately. And he does so by going back to sleep and sending his dream self to the power apartment. Meanwhile at the power apartment, home of the dishwashing doers of chores. Julie is reading and unloading the dishwasher to Jack, who is standing upside down on the ceiling. Julie is also reading a book on adolescent psychology and conducting some armchair psychology on her older brother, Alex. He is pegging his attitude to low self-esteem. Hard agree. Franklin fades into view and nearly gives the two preteens a heart attack. While their exclamations do not alarm the power parents, it does cause the other two kids to coalesce into the kitchen. Franklin quickly breaks the incorrect news to the assembled quartet. The snarks are back in town, the snarks are back in town. Woo, woo, woo. What? Only you can do parodies? Apparently, yes. Hard, sad face. They tell Franklin to meet them up on the roof, and then they go and hoodwink their parents. Feigning mass sleepiness, the four fledglings kiss their mommy and daddy goodnight and then set up their rooms to look like they are sleeping with the old pillow under the sheets trick. To be fair, Jack is the only one really pushing the others to set up this ruse, and all of the others express their hesitation or worry about all this sneaking around and lying. Jack is insistent that they have their powers to save the world, so that is what they should do. Also, he thinks that all this sneaking around and lying is cool. Past that, he argues that their parents won't catch them this time because they haven't caught them yet. See? Jack understands that if you are on a hot streak, it won't ever end, so you should always increase your risk-to-reward ratio because that's how logic works. No, Jack! That isn't how logic works! Your argument is a gambler's fallacy. Just because your coin has come up heads every other time you have snuck out doesn't mean it won't come up tails in the future. By the way, I'm also going to go play poker... Oh, wrong time to mention it. Your turn. <laughs> but the cards are hot. Got a feeling Lady Luck's on my shoulder tonight. Luck be a lady tonight. Yeah. Well, fallacy or not, this argument follows them out of their bedroom window and up onto the roof. They meet up with Dream Frank, Alex powers up on the now empty barrels of roofing compound from about ten issues ago, and they head off into the now darkening yonder. Frank leads them to a building where Sunspat and Warlock are still sitting back to back. And of course, their shadowy outline looks just like a snark. Why does it look like this, you might ask? Well, because when heroes meet for the first time, there has to be some misunderstanding where they get into a punch-up until they sort out their mutual confusion. You know, standard operating procedure. Guess what? They haven't met before, so this fight needs to happen. And happen it does. Team crashes into the two mutants, knocking them out of the window and to the alley below. Womp! Luckily, Counterweight was able to degravitize them all, so they landed relatively softly. I'm sorry, who did what now? Counterweight, he used his zero-G powers to basically cast Featherfall. No, I, I get that. What I'm asking is, who is Counterweight? Counterweight. Counterweight is Jack. You know, the voice you do? You know, we cover that in the featuring section at the beginning of this podcast, right? Yeah, I, I do. But when did Jack pick the name, though? I haven't heard them talk about it before this. Hmm, um, I guess right now... 
That or Julie picked the name for him by yelling it, I know, Massive Hell. Okay, well, speaking of Julie, Julie attempts to Julie Hammer Warlock, who has his mouth open at the moment. Funk. And gets swallowed by the robot, who immediately looks like he has a tummy ache. Gulp. Burp. You know, I don't know if she has yet to successfully use that move even once. While Julie sits in the transparent bubble that Warlock's stomach has become, Sunspot picks up a wall to throw at the kids. Alex unleashes a powerball at the wall. Shracked. Which effectively ends the fight as all of the kids are now in a giant heap on the ground with Franklin standing above them asking, How come you pretended to be a snark? Yes, while Power Pack assumed they were fighting a snark for some reason after they saw their opponents, the New Mutants thought they were fighting supervillains. Oh, and Warlock blew the gaseous form of Julie out of his head while he was adjusting the pressure in his ears, so just, you know, let that image sink in for a little while. Hang on, because both teams are embarrassed. Neither team admits they know each other. So, with Jack saying, We're strange beings from another planet who came to Earth to protect this backward world. And Sunspot responding with, Oh yeah? Well, we're visitors from another dimension, banished here and unable to return home till we prove our true heroism. Again, Jack is the leader of this ruse, just as Sunspot metaphorically twists Warlock's arm. Sunspot is really having a hard time with all of his mistakes. He really feels he is failing as a hero, especially fighting the young power pack. While the two boys are weaving these unconvincing lies, so that their mutual friends, the New Mutants, don't hear about their punch-up flub-up, a car comes careening around a corner, crashing into a concrete jersey barrier. Run! Blam! Scream! This crashed and crumpled car is cornered by a cretinous crew of criminal creeps. This mean mob of mooks menace the men in the messed up mobile. The seven supers see this scene and soon are scaring off the scrappy stupids. The best part of the scene is Julie and Katie zooming in with the creeps' faces. Once the group of goons from everyone's favorite gang, the Wolves, is gone, the two new mutants at the direction of Signor da Costa quickly change the tire of the incapacitated vehicle. And the instant it is set down, the car takes off. Whee! and is quickly followed by a cop car that is obviously chasing the two guys in the car, who have probably caused some crimes. Eww, eww. Needless to say, this is embarrassing for the young man, and he and Power Pack fly off after the car. But thanks to a well-aimed road-destroying blast from Alex, Shocked. the car and crooks come to a convincing and conclusive concrete close. As the young superheroes watch the cops take away the bad guys, Julie tries to get Jack to drop this stupid ruse. Jack, we gotta tell Sunspot and Warlock who we are. No, we told a lie. You told a lie. But you guys went along with it and we're stuck with it. Besides, look what good we're doing. We helped stop those crooks. That cancels out lying. Julie points out that her psych book would say that Jack is rationalizing his desire for adventure and the fun of living fiction, i.e., he likes to lie. Jack has just dumped another fallacy on his family. This time, it's the sunk cost fallacy, which means the more you invest in something, i.e. the lie, the harder it becomes to abandon it, i.e. telling the truth. Meanwhile, Warlock is asking if he and Sunspot can just go home. But the young boy is even more upset. How can he go home if he has not proven himself a hero? And so, they fly off and spot a prowler on a nearby roof. Warlock, look! That on the roof! A cat pagla. This is our chance to redeem ourselves. Then self and self friend Bobby can go home? Beware, villain! Who would want to burgle cats? I have two answers for you. One, no one would. And two, this is not a cat burglar. It is our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Spider-Man patrolling the city in his black costume. Oh, cool. Hey, oh, wait, no. Does that mean that Sunspot and Warlock have just gotten into another fight with another hero over another misunderstanding and Sunspot's myopic attempts at heroics? Swamp. Why, yes. Yes, they have. And as Power Pack arrives to the ongoing scenes of ignorance-fueled fighting, Bofo, hit, punch, sock, punch, swap, biff, hit, sock, swip. They can do nothing but wait for the dust to settle and see the damage. Besides the bruised ego and inflated embarrassment of both Sunspot and Warlock, there has also been a liberal helping of webs all over Bobby DaCosta, followed by an even more liberal helping of dressing down by Jack. What's the matter? You guys couldn't even recognize our pal Spider-Man? He's a good guy, you dopes! Spider-Man is taking it in stride. I guess this happens a lot. Warlock is freaking out because... Exclamation! Self-pounced attack here a Spidey person! Oh, self-shame embarrassment chagrin! Oh, whoa! 
Franklin is just patting Warlock's leg in an attempt at comfort, while Julie and Katie are trying to cheer up Bobby. Feel bad. We screw up sometimes, too. I know a guy doesn't have to be 100% heroic to be a hero. I'd settle for 5%. Spidey tells him not to sweat it, and that the webs will fall off in about an hour. Then he waves goodbye to this issue's cameo after clocking in another seven panels. Bye, Spidey. Bye, Spidey. Bobby is even more depressed. He really does not think that such miserable failures as they deserve to go home now. So he and Warlock take off to try and find other situations to screw up, stating that they should be left alone. And as this happens, Julie has an idea. So Julie starts a TED Talk to her team about heroics, psychology, and self-esteem. If they can somehow convince Sunspot he is a hero, redeem him in some way, then he will go back home, and they can sell a lot of Amway products. Julie sends Franklin to follow Bobby and Warlock and the kids start to make a plan. Julie explains that Bobby needs to fight and beat a supervillain. Her idea is to dress up in a disguise and be that supervillain. Jack is skeptical, and Julie shows him her idea with a little concentration and a... Swish! Followed by a... Swoop! The Mistress of Density pushes out her molecules, making a double-sized Julie! <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. Man, you don't look anything like a supervillain. You look like an eight-foot-tall little girl. <laughs> Alex is actually impressed, and he suggests covering her with a blanket. Katie is worried about what happens if she gets hit, but Julie has that already figured out. Come on, Jack. Try and sock me. Huh? Oh boy, I can't believe it. My sister actually wants me to suck her. Poof. Yuck! Flump. Jack's fist flies through the non-dense girl and overbalancing, he flumps onto the ground. Now that he is convinced that this plan might work, a little impressed by his sister, Julie is pleased but also worried that they are doing more lying. Kitty and Jack are sent home to get supplies, which include the random detritus from kids' rooms and closets, as well as some art supplies and a bedsheet. Let me tell you, for those that do not have kids, you can raid a kid's room and probably assemble an A-team level flamethrowing tank or MacGyver's supercomputer with the stuff that kids can collect. They join back up with the older siblings and begin to dress Julie up using all of their stuff. It's actually pretty neat seeing them all work together to create a frightening, tall, green-haired, one-eyed, horned monster. They are all very impressed with their work, and as Franklin fades in, Katie suggests that they try it out on him. Lurk, woofle, woofle, hoot. Hi, Julie. You look tall. Frank. Now that their clever ruse is set, they have to bring in their mark. Katie and Franklin fly over to find Roberto and Warlock, and boy, do they ham up this performance, begging them to help them fight this giant monster. Robert is so desperate, and this melodrama is so up his alley, that they fly right over. Alex and Jack push Julie into view, and she starts making a mess of noises and promises of destruction. Destroy! Destroy! I'm gonna destroy the city! While Sunspot is ready to start laying the smacketh downeth, Warlock is not so sure and tries to warn friend Bobby Sunspot that this monster isn't what he expected, but Bobby being Bobby does what Bobby does and not listen. Sunspot launches a mighty first punch Poof. and ends up in the dirt just like Jack did earlier. But that only gets up his anger, and after he picks himself off the ground, he is ready for round two, where he unloads all of his heroic aggression on the white-bodied monster. Sock, pow, bop, big, wham. Over. Sock, pow, bop, big, wham. And over. Sock, pow, bop, big, wham. And over. Sock, pow, bop, big, wham. Again. Once more, Warlock tries to stop Sunspot, thinking that something is odd. But Sunspot, once more does not listen. He has heedless heroing to do. Meanwhile, Julie is starting to get dizzy from getting the cloud stuffing knocked out of her over and over again, but she is not ready to end this yet. After that break, round three starts. Punch, puff, And through whoop, all of this, Warlock biff, keeps trying pow, to tell Bobby bop, that this is not chop, actually a punch, monster, but puff, their friend suck, Julie. Whoop, but Sunspot, biff, guess what, pow, is still not bop, listening, chop, and finishes punch, it all off by puff, throwing a brick suck, staircase whoop, that Warlock is biff, standing on pow, into bop, said Julie chop. monster. Zam, bam! Julie! Power Pack runs out to the empty street, crying for their lost sister and teammate. Just like Obi-Wan, she has been struck down and has disappeared. This, this is the last of Julie Power. She gone, gone, gone. And behind the sobbing children, Bobby comes to a realization that he has killed a little girl. The kids are lamenting on this being the inevitable outcome for their hubris and pride. It was all a joke, but it was all for nothing. And so they learn the terrible price for all of their lies.
Though violent was this death, that they can already see the ghost of their sister forming. Actually, wait a, wait a minute. She's looking pretty solid right now. Look, my timing was off, that's all. I barely made it, but look, ghost to cloud away. Julie, you're here! You're alive! You're okay. But it ain't all unicorns and roses. Instead of showing Sunspot that he was a hero, they made him look like a bigger idiot who was bounded by a trick and a lie. This in turn upsets Power Pack, so Julie and Jack start arguing about whose lying brought them to this fine mess. Every lie we told just got us in deeper, and this one turned out worst of all. What are you yelling at me for? It was your dumb idea! Well, I got another idea. Tell the truth. Big deal. When all else fails, you gotta fall back on the truth. And so Power Pack just lays it all out to the two new mutants about all of the lying and all of the deception and why they did what they did, all to try to help. Bobby hears all of this, but he is still using his defining superpower, which is the ability to not listen. He sees this as more proof that he has no value as a human, and he is ready to go off and really rend his garments in a dark corner when... Exclamation! Enough! If self friend Power Pack would go to all this trouble to convince you, then you must be truly worthy indeed. Friends Power Pack, we are going home. It has been self pleasure to know you. During this mechanical monologue, the sentient mechanical life form has transformed into a rocket and tossed Sunspot inside and blacks off to infinity and beyond. But mainly, he blasts off to appear later in the New Mutants Fall of the Mutants events. Yeah, they should have stayed right here feeling bad about themselves. They would have had a much better time if they did. Power Pack is tired, and after packing their pack of supplies back up, they wave goodnight to Franklin and head home, with Jack confidently talking about how everything turned out great and how a little white lie never hurt anyone. But when we get home, they find their parents in the boys' bedroom, in tears because their children are missing. Again! The kids see this from outside window and decide to come back in the house through the kitchen door, out of their costumes and armed with a lame story that they wanted to sleep on the roof. Yeah, the parents are not buying this at all. They are busted. Big time. The parents are really angry, especially at the older ones. The three older children are all grounded for two weeks. No visitors, no television, no phone, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury. Their parents are disappointed, as disappointed as they can be. I think that you uh, chose to do the rhyming for the Gilligan's Island just to show me up. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Ah, uh, pleasure. All right. Why don't we just stay tuned for the next episode with Katie's madcap adventure, where Katie makes good use of her reprieve from being grounded. And while she does that, we're going to move on to the themes of the issue. Let's talk about some things, because there's some things that we should talk about. One, you, sir, had a question about why would they attack Snarks? Why would they attack the Snarks? They're kind of... I know that they were their big adversaries for quite a while, and that there's still Snarks that are out there that might not be great, but they're kind of allies with them, and you would think that the majority that might be coming here... Say it's just like, oh, hey, I saw a Snark ship, and guess what? Kofi and Yurk are going to come for a visit. Well, that's kind of cool. They have something to tell me. Maybe uh, the Emperor's dying, and he needs access to our bank account so that he can transfer a bunch... You know what? They've had so many negative interactions with the Snarks. And they know that Queen Maraud is still out there and still willing to cause trouble to them. The Snarks really aren't allowed on the planet. If they're going to have anybody on the planet, it's going to be Kofi or Yurik or somebody like that. It's not going to be the Snarks. I think their shoot first, ask questions later attitude is completely understandable. Our last Snarks that came to the planet that weren't bringing them back um, attacked them, Jackal, and kidnapped them. You know, the people that came to get Jackal after they jackal's tail all over the place yeah, they kicked his tail in the dirt yeah uh, in the snow let's in say. the snow <laughs> so yeah i would say that they've got very good reason what's going on i could see that but it would be fun i think it would be funny if it was just like a snark scout ship that was sent because like something had happened but then even the power pack then would still be like yeah this is a kidnapping <laughs> I go with their reasoning for wanting to do that. I can totally see that. that it, yeah, that, no, attacking them makes sense. I think it was also, well, why did they do this in the story? Because uh, plot drove it, because yeah. the story said to do that. So it, it, it makes sense. It was just along the lines where I'm like, but the last interaction, the very last, which I'm going to say is the important one, is now Snarks are friends, and we are heroes. Uh, certain Snarks. Yeah, certain Snarks. And but I would say, I'd still say the majority. I mean, it's just one clan. Another thing I think we should talk about, yes. uh, for those people who are not steeped in comic book lore from the 80s like I am, and you are a little bit, the Fallen Angel series that we discussed at the very beginning of this issue, that was a miniseries that I had 
I, I have a very deep fondness for. It's an eight-issue miniseries that came out about the same time as this issue, and actually it came out just a little bit before. But it started off with Robert DaCosta and Warlock running away from the New Mutants because they got in a fight. Or, yeah, he got in an argument with Cannonball, and he hit Cannonball using his power, and it looked like he injured him very badly. So Sunspot ran off, and Warlock followed him to make sure he was okay, and he ran into a group of kids who were all mutants and who were stealing things. And on this team was a mutant called Ariel, who was actually kind of an alien from another planet, and she had a trick that she could actually open doors and use it to teleport to different places, even different worlds. Sure. She also had the ability, uh, mutant ability, where she could actually... Uh, talk people into doing things that they didn't really want to do. There was another girl whose name was Random, and she was developing a mutant power where she had kind of a chance power. Either she could increase or decrease luck. And then there was a guy named Gomi who had uh, artificial telekinesis powers, and he had two lobsters named Bill and Don the Lobster, one of which was an artificial lobster. The other one was a real lobster, that had, and they both had, like, you know, increased strength and Gomi could, you know, talk to them. It was a cool <laughs> series. And there was also Tabitha, a.k.a. Boom Boom, from uh, X-Factor fame. She was there as well, and she's got power to uh, make explosive little uh, pellets. And these, this group was uh, run by a guy named The Vanisher, which is an old X-Men I villain. remember Vanisher, yeah. yeah. And he had a power to vanish. That was his power. Yes. Played by Brad Pitt in the Deadpool 2 movie. Yes. <laughs> Um, and also, uh, Siren, who was another X Factor kind of hanger on her, her dad was Banshee. Uh, she was sent with Madrox, the multiple man, to go find, uh, Bobby DaCosta. And they kind of ended up joining this team as well. So there was just this random assortment of new mutants. They went on a bunch of crazy adventures. They even found Devil Dinosaur and Moon Boy. It was a fun, fun series, and I got a kick out of it. So this picks up right as soon as that series ended, which is just another connection to the new mutants that I always liked. Cool. I have zero recollection of that series. I'd lend it to you, but you never give back. You're right. Hey, occasionally I give stuff back. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fun series, and I, I highly recommend people look for it and read it because it's really good. And there are some people that love, love and have good memories of that series. Anyways. That's my story on Fallen Angels, and you can't talk me out of it. Of course, that lets us talk a little bit more about Sunspot and Warlock. Um, mm -hmm. Sunspot is a founding member of the New Mutants, and uh, he was part of the original group of kids that Chris Claremont wrote about way back when in the first graphic novel that Marvel Comics put out, New Mutants, number one. Charles Xavier went and found this group of kids to replace his X-Men who were lost at that time in space. It's a thing. It happens. It's a thing. It happens. Space. It's big. It's easy to get lost in. For the new mutants that he was going to teach and how to use their powers. Grooming them to be the new X-Men. Yes. And it's kind of uh, about this point in time, the new mutants comic was also written by Louise Simonson. I think she was writing this, X-Factor, and Power Pack. Yeah, okay, I so, was reading all of those. Yeah, I, so was nice I had a big run of new mutants until... I don't remember where it was, but something in the story or the art. I think it was when the art changed, and uh, it. I just kind of... Yeah, I have all of them, including New Mutants number 97 or 98. I can't remember. I got both of them, but the one with Deadpool's first appearance, which is something like $700, $800 an hour. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. Not going to sell it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, mine. No, there's a lot of things like that that are like, oh, this is worth this now. And I'm like, that's great. I own that. Oh, you have that thing? That's really expensive. It's a thing in a box. I'm not getting it. Well, I know um, Robert DaCosta, he is still bouncing around. His father was very rich. Um, yeah. And, and a criminal, I think, in yeah, uh, well, when he died, Rio de Janeiro, if I remember right. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Um, when, when his dad died, he got his money. and Yeah, he inherited a company. And yeah. I, think, I think recently, within the last five years or something, seven years, ten years, yeah. it, there was an arc where he was like the CEO of the company. He was the CEO of AIM. Oh, oh seriously? <laughs> yeah, and he was actually running a, a section of the Avengers, and it's a good run. Oh, it's that's actually really kind of interesting. Yeah. Right. He had uh, Cannonball there helping him out as his number two, and <laughs> just very intelligent, kind of like, you know, he knows how to do the power plays and, and, and move people around. So. Yeah, I recall that he was uh, good in a corporate setting. Yeah. so it, it, Maybe not the some, best hero, but good in a corporate setting. They've done some cool things with him. Okay. Uh, Warlock died-ish at one point. Well, so and, did his buddy Cypher, and he kind of reanimated at one yeah, point. It was kind of a creepy time. Yeah, and that's more or less what it's like now, uh, because Doug Ramsey and current 
X-Men lore, uh, Doug Ramsey is alive, but it's Doug Ramsey's uh, Warlock combination. But it's mostly oh, Doug, Doug Ramsey. Lock. It's mostly Doug Lock, but it's it's mostly Doug Ramsey. And this is just really, really deep comic book lore. But, yeah. Uh, so, Warlock, the robot is pretty much... He, yeah, he's gone. Okay. Although there was, there was a New Mutants book that just came out, a legacy book that Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz did, and it's really good. It's kind of a throwback to the time when he was doing the art for New Mutants, and it's, it's a really good book. I picked it up. just okay. came out a few months, like last month. What are your thoughts on Warlock? I like Warlock. I, I do. I've, I've always been a fan of him. Um, I liked him, saw him when I was a kid. I enjoyed the character. I think I enjoyed him the best when he was interacting with Cypher. Because I think that was a good combination yeah. with with you know Cipher not having offensive powers and Warlock being there to be kind of his shield and being his good close friend. I always liked Cipher, but yeah, yeah. I, I was a big Cipher Doug Ramsey fan too. Yeah. Um, but I, I've always liked Warlock. I've always I, I've never had a problem with him as a character. I know that some people did, but I liked it as a I kind of liked it as a stand in for stand in for me the reader. Yeah. Because he was alien, always trying to figure out how the world worked. And it was kind of like, for me, the reader, going in and saying, well, how do these people work? And how does, you know, how does this world of Marvel Comics and 616 work? And his interactions always kind of made me feel that I wasn't alone, just trying to figure <laughs> out what's happening. So, I, I don't know. I've, I've always kind of liked the character. I've always kind of had a pendulum swing on Warlock, where it's just like, oh, I like Warlock. Then I'm like, ah, I don't like Warlock. And, and it just kind of goes back and forth. And even in this issue, as soon as I you know, I crack it open I, and, I, and I see him very first page, I'm like, eh, Warlock. But by the end, I'm like, yeah, Warlock. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know what I think about him. I, I do like him. I do like him as Doug Lock. I do yeah. like him hanging out with Cypher. I think that's really cool. I think one of the problems I got tired of was that, oh, now it's Warlock's dad, and it's the whole technical thing. Yeah, it, it can get a little deep with some of the, the some of that extra stuff, but yeah. I always liked how he was always a good, good friend. He is a good, good friend, really. I mean, he kind of talks a little bit funny and stuff, but eh, so what? He is, so do he, I. Yeah, everybody does. Uh, he If he is a friend, he is. He may not understand exactly all the nuances, but he's there for you, and he, he's... He's your cheerleader. Yeah. He's your cheerleading section. Uh, the last thing I really want to talk about is uh, the kids really trying to explore what is the truth. Uh. Which, yeah. <laughs> I do like how this issue kind of operates within that framework of what is truth and when is it okay to lie? And I think we can come to the realization that it's never okay to lie. <laughs> Well, I would argue that. I, I, but, yeah. I would argue that too. But I mean, the way that this book really presents it, it's like there's nothing, nothing good that came from lying yeah. throughout this entire thing. No. Uh, yeah, honestly. Well, about the best part of it, that the best thing that came out of this is that Warlock got tired of uh, DaCosta's garbage and just said, hey, you know what? We're done with this pity party. It's been, it's pretty late and we need, the pity party needs to close. Right. We're going home. But once that again, is about what, the best part of the about but once that. Again, yeah. I mean, that, that, it, that was just time. Yeah. It, I think that if there was a good conversation, I think they could have gotten there a lot faster. Oh, yeah. So, and Warlock wouldn't have had to resort to that. Just forcing. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, at the end, the kids have lied and snuck out of the house yeah. and they've gotten caught and now they're in trouble and everybody's sad about it. I mean, the only person that didn't get in trouble is Frank. Well, it's Franklin, Frank because- and Katie. Katie didn't get in trouble either because she did not get grounded. Although she, she was still gotten in trouble, <laughs> she should have. But it, it was just along the line, you know. As I understand, kind of both things. I, honestly, my thought of you know, we call it a lame, a lame story of oh, we wanted to sleep on the roof. Yeah, it is kind of a lame story, but it's also kind of believable. Where it's just like, hey, where were you? Well, we went to the roof because we used to sleep outside at yeah. home at home at the beach all the time you know, but we tried it here and it's really cold out there it's not the same and the parents freaking out because they have had their kids kidnapped right. and so they're going to be very hypersensitive about it. so it does in fact make sense yeah and, uh, and, 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 and at the same time uh did they need to get grounded i don't fully know that but yeah, did they not yeah I, they, I, they did they they need to get grounded. for what the parents know they just know that they kind of did something dumb didn't do like and, what they were thinking. Yeah, they, your child's still two. <laughs> yeah, I ground her every day, except she tell, tells me no. There are things that my daughter does now, now that she's got a little bit of independence, and I have to explain to her that no, 
that is not okay. You gave me a heart attack, okay. and you were, your actions uh, yeah, gave I me can, the heart attack. Okay, I can fully so understand that. Then. Yeah. She doesn't quite know where the line is of what is right, what is wrong, and you know, trying to teach her the, some of the morals of that, too, yeah. and explain to her that you know, this is not okay. I'm going to, well, I don't ground her, but, you know, you will go and stand in that corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know she doesn't do that that much. Psychology. I have no segue on that. I'm just going to say psychology. <laughs> That's the best segue sometimes is just to yell something different. I, uh, I want to break out the library card. Julie was reading an actual book. And yeah, it was called, was. you know, Child Psychology, and it was written by an author. I tried looking that up. I could not find that at all. I, you know, tried different variations on the name that was on the book, and no luck. So instead, I decided to talk kind of briefly about some of the top female psychologists that are have been recognized. And I got a list off of the internet, and it was part of a collaborative piece produced by Health Psych, with research, writing, and editorial assistance from Elena bauman Kybri and Kim Prout, LCSW. I'm going to just talk about 10 of these. Uh, Jane Addams... From 1860 to 1935, she won worldwide recognition in her lifetime as a pioneer social worker in America, social reformer, activist, philosopher, feminist, sociologist, author, and leader in women's suffrage and world peace. And in 1920, she co-founded the ACLU. In 1931, she became the first American woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And she is regarded as the founder of the social work profession in the United States. Mary Whitten Culkins, 1863 to 1930. American philosopher and psychologist who became the first woman to serve as president of the American Psychological Association in 1905 and the American Philosophical Association. She worked as a psychology professor at Wellesby College and opened the first female-founded psychology lab there in 1891. In 1894, she would have been the first woman to receive a PhD in psychology, but was denied because of her sex. Thank God we've changed that. Melanie Klein, 1882-1960. Pioneering child analyst from Central Europe and considered one of the founding figures of psychoanalysis through her work and study with young children. First person to use traditional psychoanalysis with young children. Karen Horney, 1885 to 1952. German psychoanalyst born in 1885 and credited with founding feminist psychology, which studies the way gender power imbalances impact the developmental and psychological theories and therefore mental health treatment. Anna Freud, 1895 to 1982. Austrian British psychoanalysis was the youngest child of Sigmund Freud. Her book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense, laid the groundwork for the field of ego psychology and emphasized the importance of the ego and its ability to be manipulated socially. Mary Ainsworth, 1913 to 1999, American Canadian psychologist, best known for her study and development in the attachment theory. Virginia Satter, 1916 to 1988, an American author and social worker recognized as a pioneer for her approach to family therapy and her work with family reconstruction. Mammy Phillips Clark, an American social psychologist and community health pioneer whose master thesis, The Development of Consciousness of Self in Negro Preschool Children, which played a key role in the Brown vs. Board of Education decision in 1951. And I'll end off this list with Eleanor McCoby, who was born in 1917. An American psychologist recognized for her research and contributions to the field of child and family psychology. Her career focused on a study of developmental psychology with particular attention to the differences of the sexes, gender development, gender differentiation, and child development. So I really wanted to just highlight the work that these women have done and the great advancements they've made in the field of science. And speaking of science, you got some science for me, sir? Well, I might not actually have any science this time, but I do have something. In this issue, Sunspot and Warlock changed a flat tire on a car as a helpful, heroic act to help out a stranded motorist. And they did it pretty speedily. Of course, that then let these felons continue their getaway from the police, but that is besides the point. It did get me thinking, though, that our listeners may not know how to change a tire. So let's cover that here. As soon as you realize you have a flat tire, do not abruptly brake or turn. Slowly reduce speed and scan your surroundings for a level straight stretch of road with a wide shoulder. Once in this safe location, put on your parking brake and turn on your hazard lights. Next, remove the hubcap or wheel cover to expose the lug nuts. Then loosen these lug nuts about a quarter to a half of a turn. Then place the jack beneath the vehicle frame alongside the tire that's flat. Many vehicle frames have molded plastic on the bottom with a cleared area of exposed metal specifically for the jack. After it is in place, raise the vehicle until the flat tire is about 6 inches above the ground. 
Now it's time to remove the lug nuts all the way. Since you've already loosened them, you should be able to unscrew them mostly by hand. Once they are off, remove the flat tire and replace the spare on the hub by lining up the rim with the lug nuts and pushing into place. Put the lug nuts back on the lug bolts and tighten them all the way by hand. Then use the jack to lower the vehicle so that the spare tire is resting on the ground, but the full of the vehicle isn't fully on the tire. At this point, you can tighten the lug nuts with the wrench, turning clockwise as much as you can. Push down on the lug wrench with the full weight of your body. Then bring the vehicle all the way to the ground and remove the jack. Give the lug nuts another pull with the wrench to ensure they're as tight as possible. Finally, replace the hubcap, stow your gear, and check the pressure of the replacement tire. That's Science Corner, and that's how to change a tire. I hope you don't need to, but it is a really good skill to have. In case I ever have to do this, I'm just calling my friendly neighborhood Jack, a.k.a. Jeff. Uh, yeah, you, you wouldn't be the only one. I've changed a lot of tires in my day. You don't mean to brag, but you've changed a lot of tires in your day. Most of them not my own. <laughs> Next time that you do that, I'd like you to do me a favor. I could do that. And take a picture of it and p so I can put it on my refrigerator. I just do that. Hey, you know what else we could put on that refrigerator? What else, Jeff? Pictures of the art from this issue. You don't say. I do say. Well, let's say some more then. Why don't you tell me what your funny backup one is, sir? My joke backup one is on page 11, and I call it Pointless Punch-Up. Sunspot, Warlock, and Spider-Man are all in a tussle, and uh, it's the kind of the upper right-hand photo of them all fighting and power packs flying into the background. And it is just... All there's just so much dust and smoke rising up, and everybody's just shooting webs and punching. And Warlock's arms are really long, and it just, it's just this tangle of what the heck is happening here. But it is just literally a pointless punch. Yes. Yep. 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 I agree. Yep. What's your uh, joke backup? My joke backup is a couple pages before that, and it's on the top corner of the page, and I call it the Intimidators, <laughs> and it is Warlock and Sunspot doing their best heroic poses as they're intimidating in front of the these group of the wolves, you know, bad guys. Yeah, the gang members the gang that are members. hassling this car that just and, wrecked. And it's just, Warlock's face is funny, because he's just got this comical, like, yeah. type of look on his face, and, and Sunspot's looking all buff, and like, you will stay back, villains. Yeah, he's got a, his right hand, the fingers pointing up, you know, his pointing fingers pointing up at the sky, and his left hand's outstretched, you know, in a big old open palm. Hold, you know, stay back, villains. Listen to the words I say, for I shall exclaim. Yeah, it's, it's... It's a good one. It's a good one. I like that quite a little bit. What do you have for your top funny one? My top funny one is on page 17, and I call it Reluctant Monster. And it is on the uh, middle left-hand side of the page, and it is when uh, Katie and Frank are guiding Warlock and Sunspot back to, you know, the ambush point where the super monster is going to get them. And it shows a, uh, and it shows Alex kind of on lookout, and uh, Jack is just grinning the biggest grin he can possibly have as he's pushing the Julie monster out of the alleyway to, uh, you know, engage in the superhero fight that and she's going to do. Really reluctant to do it. I like yeah, it too, yeah, because she's just leaning back. Well, I, I, I don't think she can really see out of her costume very right. well anyway. So <laughs> I'm going to go back to page 12 right after the the uh, Spider-Man fight, and this has got Spider-Man. With his hand on the back of Bobby's back, saying, there, there, son, it happens a lot. Oh, let me get this off your face, because I call this, you got something on your face, as he's pulling some webbing off <laughs> yeah. of Bobby's face. That is a dejected-looking Bobby, just too. Just a dejected look. Let me just pull this. Sorry about the webbing. It'll, <laughs> yeah, it'll you, come off. You got some sput, sput Sean, you know, just... <laughs> I'll just wipe it with my thumb. Just going to pull that off a little bit. <laughs> What do you have for your backup good one? My backup good one is on page 18, and I call it Return of the Pointless Punch-Up. And this is uh, on the top right-hand corner of the page, and it is when uh, Sunspot is just going to town on this big old eight-foot Julie monster, and he's just swing, 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 swinging, and it's got, you know, he's got like, 12 different arms flying in kind of shadow form saying that he's punching real fast and uh you know the julie monsters really reeling back kind of you know getting turned to getting turned to clouds and just the background of it it's just the sound effects which is sock pop bip 
Wap, bop, 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 just repetitively sock pow bop biff wah. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, this just shows, oh, he's going to be a hero. He's going to defeat this monster. He's going to go, 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 go. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's just great. I just really like the way that looks. I'm going to go to the next page for mine. Yeah. And this is, I'm, I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. It's the entire top level there. Yeah, I could see that. Because it's the, the culmination of that fight where he's continued the punching, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight panels on that top area. And it's him just beating up. You see, it's like his face. You see Julie's, or the monster's face. You see Warlock's face. You see his arm. It's just these constant series of, like, different hits and punches that are occurring and just the, the Julie monster stage. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love the fact, too. He's, he's like, oh, when I punch it, it feels like I'm punching air. I, and it's like Warlock's out. Do you see the, do you see her, do you see the feet? And it's like, I see his fancy footwork. Yeah, it's just, it's just like, oh, he's so fast on his feet. Oh, this dodgy monster. I'm going to get it eventually. Yeah. What about the top one? What do you got? And I, I'd be surprised if we don't have the same top one. Well, I would be surprised if we have the same uh, top picture. Mine is on page three, and I call it Sunspot's Sunset Pursuit. I can see this. I yeah. can see this. That's a nice one. It's the very top of the page, and it's when uh, Sunspot is riding on uh, kind of a warlock, you know, rocket sled chasing after the vulture, and it's over the city and the sun setting, and it's just this beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful sunset over the city, and I yeah. just, I like cityscapes. It's got, it's got I like lot, it. Got yeah. a lot of nice color to it. Yeah, too. it's got a lot of nice color. It's just, I love sunsets, and uh, it even has some of that, you know, kind of like, Vulture's in shadow, you know, the warlock and, you know, the heroes are in shadow. And it's just, I really like it. It has a lot of things that are like, oh, I like that thing. (laughs) That's my top one. I can see that. I can see that. Well, my top one was on page seven. And I call this one just a normal weekday night. And this one, we've got Sunspot throwing a wall at the kids. You've got uh, Warlock sitting down with the Julie in his stomach. You've got... Alex and Jack falling backwards away from uh, Sunspot and Katie landing with her rainbow. A lot of action. <laughs> there is a lot going on. Yeah. And uh, Sunspot does a lot of property damage in this issue. He's, yes, he does. He's tearing off walls of people's places. He, he tore off somebody's stoop. Bro, at the, at the Julie monster. Okay, although it was in a, uh, they said it was an embalmed out kind of derelict area. Right. He's, he's not really doing good. He has, he has done zero good. The best thing he did was chase the vulture. Right. There was no outcome of nope. that other than that he chased the vulture. Yeah. That's the best thing he did in this entire issue. You know, he's just doing what X Men do. They come and they destroy things. That's yeah. that's it's their mo. It's what they're good at. Eventually, say, and we were victorious, and then they go back home to their mansion, and maybe to Harry's bar to drink beer. Yeah, like fair air. <laughs> and when they go back to their mansion or back to Harry's bar, they go back and. They trade insults. Yes, they do. Rubber glue moment. What is the best or most childish insult in this comic book? I'll start with uh, what I call as page. And this one is from Alex. Warlock and Bobby have gone off to talk, and the power kids with Franklin, they're all sitting around, and, you know, Jack's, and they're all looking at Jack, what are you doing? What are you, you know, why are you saying this? And Alex does, asks a very good question to Jack. You're nuts, Jack. Yeah, I know it. It ends in a question mark, and it's just a statement. It's a statement. It's a fact. It is. It, a there's fact. no question yeah. on it. It at is all. a statement with, that ends with a question mark. That is pretty good. What do you got? My backup insult is on page thirteen, and it is a Jack one. And this is after Julie has, uh, you know, gassed and solidified up, but she's now like an eight foot tall, uh, Julie. And uh, Jack looks at her, and he just starts laughing and pointing, and he says, Man, you don't look anything like a super villain. You look like an eight-foot-tall little girl. Uh, I just think calling somebody an eight-foot-tall little girl is pretty insulting and funny. I'm sorry. If somebody looked like an eight-foot-tall little girl, I wouldn't try to insult them, because I'm pretty sure they would found me oh i know there's that but this is <laughs> this in jack's mindset it's a hilarious insult yes. and i liked it i thought it was pretty great well i'm gonna move on to page 15 this is in the midst of when they're doing their art project on julian they're making the monster yep. and alex has a comment about how good this is looking uh, i know which one you're doing 
wait till I draw the mouth. Hee <laughs> She's going to be uglier than old Carmody. Yeah. Yeah. S- insulting someone by saying that they're uglier than old, old Carmody. Carmody. I'm I sorry. Know. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, Alex. That's Good a pretty job. great one. Yeah. That, uh, I also love the fact that, uh, yeah, that, hey, a callback. Uh, yeah, it's a callback to an old villain. Yeah. And also, maybe a uh, maybe a future premonition theme. for a little future theme. Maybe a little bit of foreshadowing. Maybe, maybe. you're soaking in it. Mm, maybe. What do you got for your top one? My top one is on page 11, and it's another Jack line. And this is. Yeah, shocker, shocker. And this is after uh, uh, (laughs) Warlock and Sunspot figure out that they've been fighting Spider Man. And uh, Jack just starts burning into him with with telling him, What's the matter? You guys couldn't even recognize our pal Spider Man? He's a good guy, you dopes. You dopes. You dopes. You dopes. That's just great. Just in the aspect of just saying, you don't recognize Spider-Man? You're dumb. You know, you're dumb. <laughs> I just, so you're dopes because you don't see know who Spider-Man is. So that's my top insult. All right. That brings us to Stars and Detention. Who do we think is the best? Who do we think is the worst in this book? Well, Jeff. Let's do the worst and let's do it together. Because I'm going to guess that we're going to have a full table. We might. Full set of chairs. I'm going to, well, full set of chairs. We choose a bunch of different people. Oh, throughout. that's right. Yeah. If we're going to match, we're going to match on both of them. Yes. I'm going to say we are. Jack. Jack is what I wrote down. Yes. Jack was the worst. Why do you feel that it was Jack? Well, it's really his fault that they're in this fine mess again, Ollie. Yeah, um, it's very true. Yeah. <laughs> He had bad ideas the entire night. But he was so happy with himself. But yes, yes. he was terrible yes. and just dragging everybody along with it. Yes. I mean, really, if if we could pull the new mutants into this one, yeah. I would say that the worst would be Bobby DeCosta. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. That's I would, pretty obvious. I he would was... take him for the, for the worst. And on the same token, I think I would actually say the best would have been Morlock. But because we don't have them there, who yep. do you think your best one is? Best one is going to be Julie. Julie. Okay. Yeah, yes. Julie. Julie, Julie, Julie. 100% <laughs> did Julie. did match on this one. I liked her idea. Uh, she had a great use of her powers. That yeah. was, oh, that yeah. was a brand new use of her powers that no one thought about. Yeah, we haven't seen that before, which is amazing. Anytime anybody... That's a definite point if you yes. go, here's a new uh, power feat. Yeah. But I stunted my power. My power can now do a new thing. Right. I'm all for that. Yeah. And, and she was using her book smarts. Yeah. And she just, yeah, she was very, very good in this issue. Yeah. Everything that she was doing was pretty great. Yeah. All right. Then let's go ahead and talk about G count. All right. That's going to be a fast one because it was zero G, which you could find in space. That gives us a G average of zero. 0.94, which is approaching the surface gravity of Saturn and a G total of 31. We have way left the uh, uh, G count behind by two. All right, let's talk about the power rank. We have 36 now on this list, starting with um, power pack number 25, power trip, and ending with X Factor annual number two. Where are you feeling? I, I kind of like this story. I know you like this one better than I do. Uh, for me, I'm not a big fan of this. I think in part just because it's lying is bad, but let's lie. But lying is bad. Let's lie. Oh, we'll never get caught. Oh, we were caught. Oh, what was us? We lied and okay. we learned our lesson. And then the aspect of everything about Sunspot. I, I just saw this as a very bubblegum-esque type issue that's a lot of fun and kind of goofy and silly. I, okay, you say that and I can see that as well. So that that will raise my estimation of it up. What is your... What's the height? What's your ceiling that you can't go past? You tell me where you would like it, and then I will either argue down or be complacent and go like, yeah, whatever. All right. Um, well, we just got finished with the crack run. You right. like this more or less than the crack run? Hmm. Uh, I think I like the crack run better, actually. Okay. Looking around there, we've got the 29th place right below crack up is power pack number eight, which is monsters. Of course, it gets into Dragon Oh, the Man. Dragon Man saga. Right? Yeah. This is better than Dragon Man. This is better than Dragon Man. Okay, yeah. well then, we're going to put it right there then. We'll put it right at number 29 uh, between Crack Up, issue number 30, and Monsters, issue number 8. Okay, hey, you good with that? I'm fine with that. That's right. good for me. All right, excellent. It's been placed. It's been placed. It is set in stone for all time, and when the future oh. King of England comes, he can pull this one out of a stone and say, that seems like narratively impossible. This was just words. With that, uh, we need to talk about our beer. Yes. What you thinking? 
Huh. All drink. Game we can play at home. <laughs> Get your beer and let us know what you think. Um, not bad. It's definitely not something I'm probably going to have again. It's very strong. It's very strong. Uh, I can feel the strong. That's the thing. I'm thinking, as the evening has progressed, as the hour has gone on, I've been kind of like, no, it's not as bad as I was kind of saying at the beginning. And then I kind of pick up the bottle and look at the label. Like, 14.3 is why I'm kind of like, yeah, it's okay. There's a flavor in my mouth, but I'm liking the bubbly drinky drink. So, yeah. Again, yeah, it's, I have had plenty of worse beverages. Yeah. Would I go for this again actively? No, not actively. If right. it was around, yeah, I don't know. I'd be like, hey, I've had that. Yeah, sure. Put it in put it in a cup. I want to get somewhere. You ready to do uh, Powerballs? I'm ready to do Powerballs on this. I, I'm going to give it a, a two and a half. I think I'm going to... I think I might actually follow you on that. I'm, I'm, I'm heaving between the three and the two and a half, but mm-hmm. I, I think that if I'm going to drink something that's going to be this strong... I want to enjoy it a bit more. Yeah, I the thing I enjoy about this, I think, is the fourteen point three, and it, it's not really the flavor. It's not right. it's not that barley. It's not that wine. It's not the bourbon barrel flavor. It, it none of that really is like, oh, I love all of these. No, it's it's very much just kind of like I can tolerate this, and yeah, I like fuzzy, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> so yeah, be willing to drink it again. Would not seek it out. All right, sounds good. And now that we've talked about a beer, let's talk about children, or in this case, kids' perspective. And that's where Rick talks to his daughter, Carrie, about the issue that we just covered. So, Rick and Carrie, thoughts? Hi, Carrie. Hi. How are you today? Awesome. And you? I'm doing really good. Um, Thank you for reading that book. What did you think of it? It was nice. What do you mean, nice? I mean, it was nice lying story. Nice lying story. Okay, tell me what you mean about that. Jack lied. Everybody's just lying in this book. Why were they lying? Because it would keep them their secret identities more secret, I suppose. Yeah, that's some of the reasons. Was there any good reasons for them to be lying? Probably not. Except for when they were trying to get themselves out of trouble. Yeah, I guess so. But you, they shouldn't have snuck out, right? Yeah. What did you think about Warlock? Um, I like him. I I don't know if he's a bad guy or not. He's not a bad guy. He's a good guy. Okay. So they're just ba- they're just good guys trying to be good guys. They they're good guys. Roberto thinks that he's a bad guy because he did something wrong once, and so he thinks that he needs to try to be very heroic. And Morlock's just trying to be a good friend to him. But what do you think about Warlock, though? Do you think he's kind of silly, or do you think he's fun? Yeah, he's fun. He's fun? Mm-hmm. Even though you thought he was a villain? <laughs> what was your favorite part in the book? Um, I think I liked the part when Julie grows. Oh, when she... When she grows, and then she says, Come on, Jack, try and sock me. <laughs> that is pretty good, isn't it? Mm-hmm. What about the cover? What do you think of the cover? It represents what happens. Yeah. Spider-Man's not completely in there, but... (laughs) Sort of in there. Just a little bit. Yeah. Guess he's enough to make the cover. Yes. Like Beta Rate Bill. (laughs) So you like the book overall, though? Yeah. Kind of fun, kind of silly. Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of nice seeing uh, them use their powers in a different way. Yeah. What about the end of the book? When they got in trouble. You know what I've always wondered about? Why Kate? Why is Kitty... Okay, well, I probably know why Kitty's crying now. Because the older kids got in trouble, I suppose. And the parents yelled at all of them, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. But Kitty's the only one actually crying. Julie looks like she's going to cry, but she's not. So they they got in some trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think they deserve to be in trouble? Probably. That scared their parents. Right. Um, yeah. So if you sneak out and we catch you, you're in big trouble. Okay. (laughs) Anything else you want to talk about? Um, no. Okay. Thank you very much, Carrie. You're welcome. I love you. Love you too. I want to talk about some shouting out time. It's time to recognize those listeners that... Take the time to write in or leave us a review. And this is for episode 41, 
issue number 31, Crackdown, with our guest, Al Sedano. Speaking of Al Sedano, he liked it. Al Sedano and the Warlock Thanos podcast. CH0. Charles Gears. Chris at BTO Bat Books. Comics in the Golden Age. Cullen Stapleton and the worst comic podcast ever. Dan Grote. Dave Shevlin. Fan Film Friday's podcast. Gene Hendricks. Jerome. Gibson. He had never noticed the drawn-on stash that was on uh, Jack for his Frenchman costume, and he found it amazing. As did we. Green Lantern HG. Into the Weird. Jeff Pollier. Jeremy Daw. Jeremy Wiggins. Kevin Baker. Kyle Sinelli. Al, who thinks that Power Pack stuff should show up in more Marvel lore and Trash should get their own miniseries. Max Trevor. Mr. Rogers Core. NZ Waffles, who thought it was a great episode. Thank you. Pat, DJ Cristados Sampson, and the Long Box Crusade. Rad Adventures. Sailor Bear Zodar. Sean in the Secret Wars and Beyond podcast. Source Material Comics podcast. Stephen Gray. Thor Edison. And our buddy... Tim Price, who is always commenting on our webpage. You should, too. Join us. Yeah, come on over. It's lonely there, and we'd like the company. Be sure to check out the other shows that I am on, Rick Meets the Legion, which you can find at Comic Reflections, and stuff that Jeff and I both are on, which is our junior agent submissions on the MI6 Rookie Agent episodes of On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Right now, it is just shirts and stickers around our logo. But we will try to come up with some other fun stuff for our fans. So, go to redbubble.com and search for Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff and Rick Presents is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a live studio audience of some half-filled beer bottles in Portland, Oregon. If you would like to interact with us through the magic of the interwebs, you can do so through Twitter at Jeff and Rick Present. Our Facebook page, Jeff and Rick Present. Our email address, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word at gmail.com or at our website, Jeff and Rick Present dot WordPress dot com. Well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to do everything in a Jack voice from here on. And if you would like to help support our show, we're on Patreon. Maybe I'll stop there. You can find us at patreon.com. Jeff and Rick Present, all one word. We are a supporter of the Hero Initiative. And we will be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to HeroInitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. Exclamation! And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife Cindy and our daughter Carrie. My fiance Hillary and our daughter Aurora. We love you. Until next time. Costumes off. Our theme music is 80s action. Also featured in this episode is Big Brock. All music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. I'm a little sad. <laughs> Aww. I'm at your house for Thanksgiving when you're not going to be there. You're very good for it. I invited you to my house. Okay, that's true. Fine. I'll let you stay here. Sock, pow, bop, big ram. Julie is also reading a book on adolescent psychology and conducting some armchair psychology on their older brother, Alex, and I've run out of... <gasps> Sock, pow, bop, big ram. Franklin fades into view and nearly gives his two preteens... Franklin fades into view and nearly gives his new... <laughs> Sock, pow, bop, big ram. Yes. While Power Pack assumed they were fighting a snark for some reason after they saw their... Okay, first of all, why were they going to go fight a snark anyway? At this point, they're friends with... We'll get to that. I know. It's Yeah, it's just... It's one of those things that just sticks in my craw. I'm like, why are you out? Yeah, dirty snarks. Well, it, it, <clears throat> it, it might be Queen Maraud. Oh. But now you're profiling. <laughs> just go on. We'll talk about this later. Sock, pow, bop... Big ram. Insert eo eo. Yo o o. Sock pow bop big ram. Once more, Al- Alex doesn't do nothing. Once more, Alex is hiding in an alley. He just tells Roberto nothing. Jack yells, "You suck, is a hero. It is a teenager." And Alex is like, "Jack, don't say that." <laughs>